So very briefly, my contribution today will be a little bit of an overview of specialty courts, specifically focusing on drug and alcohol abuse courts here in Texas. I will be presenting to you a conversation I had with Judge Diane Bull. She was a pioneer in the mental health court, specialty court, drug court programs here in Houston, Texas, where it began and can still continues to contribute to specialty courts across the nation through training, um, evaluation, so on and so forth. I will then also present to you a conversation I had with several individuals who have gone through probation in the past. Some of them um, are now off probation, will be sharing their experiences. Some of them went through probation and have become probation officers themselves. And so I will be sharing that as well. I'm going to go ahead right now and begin with Judge Diane Bull by sharing my screen. All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, it is my honor to introduce you to Judge Diane Bull, who I have here with me. Judge Bull is a former specialty court judge in Harris County, Houston, and a pioneer in the drug courts, specialty courts area. She is now involved in training treatment court teams and does a lot of that around the country. Judge Bull, thank you for being here with us today. She will spend some time answering a couple of questions and talking to us about specialty courts and treatment courts within Houston and across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Narvi. So we can start off by just having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved in treatment courts. Well, of course, as you said, I'm a retired judge. I've been in criminal justice for 37 years. I started out as a prosecutor. Uh, I was a, did some defense work as well. I was a, a staff attorney at a police union. So I have worn several hats in criminal justice, uh, but I was on the criminal bench for 24 years in a criminal misdemeanor court. And the way I got um, involved um, in treatment courses back in 2008, uh, the Texas legislature uh, created some legislation mandating that all large counties create DWI courts. So DWI courts are a kind of drug court. We fully embrace the drug court model. So Texas and particularly Harris County were having a really big problem with DWIs. Houston has the unhappy distinction of being in the deadliest county in America for alcohol-related fatalities. We were filing over 13,000 DWIs DWIs a year. And, and so there, you know, when it comes to loss of life, personal injury, property damage, there, there's no crime that has more heartache, you know, just, just devastation. So uh, we, we really embraced this opportunity, uh, but we didn't know a lot about it. I mean, this is Texas. I, I come from a very punitive, you know, prosecutorial lock them up background, but, you know, it, it had become clear to me and our colleagues that really for a big subsection of the people that we were dealing with, uh, that approach was not working. And, and now we know from research that about half of the people that we're dealing with uh, are really kind of in the throes of addiction. And so they are, they're coming back through that revolving door. And so we know that the drug court model is a proven intervention that's particularly effective. So we uh, got the training in the model and we started you know, from the ground floor up. So a key factor, a key feature of the drug court model is this multidisciplinary team approach. So we started gathering the team and it's very representative of the criminal justice community. We have a prosecutor on the team who's the, the voice of public safety. We have a public defender uh, who's the kind of vigilantly, you know, looking out for the due process rights of the participants. Because even though we do, we're non-adversarial, we operate somewhat informally, these are still real courts and the rules still do apply. This is a dangerous population. So we do have to vigilantly monitor them. So supervision, community supervision, probation is a big part of what we do. Um, they're led by judges. So of course, every team has a judge on board. But most importantly, we have a treatment provider who's delivering evidence-based manualized treatment that's been proven to work. So that's our team. And so we meet every two weeks, we collaborate, we review 
participant progress and we respond to that behavior. A big part of what we do is interact on a very personal level. So judges are really called to build this working relationship with each and every participant, which is so wonderful because normally judges, we don't ever see the person after sentencing unless something really terrible has happened to bring them back into you know, our view. Um, so I, in a very real way, I'm part of each individual's recovery journey. And that is really has been a rare privilege. And I think we've talked about this. I think it's not only made me a better judge along the way, it's made me a better human being. And just really um, that has been the focus of what we do because these people do come to us from a pretty dark place. Uh, they, they don't have a lot of people in their lives, uh, you know, instilling hope and, and providing validation. Um, so that's uh, a lot of what we do. And we're teaching new skills. We're building citizenship. And, and we're really trying to instill confidence that, yes, you can do this. So uh, that's, that's a big focus. I think probably I over answered your question. <laughs> no, no, this is great. It's really good to know. Uh, we're, we're giving information to people who might not have anything have ever heard about the drug courts or specialty courts. So I'm, I appreciate that. You did kind of answer my next question about what exactly treatment courts are. Um, but it seems like there's a, a very person-centered approach that's used in the treatment court model, which is amazing. I did want to know uh, how long is the treatment usually? Does it differ case by case? Typically, um, so we treatment courts are for the high risk, high need population, right? And the only way we can know that is by using validated assessment tools and 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 you know determining that right and so typically the these people need about 200 hours of evidence based treatment delivered typically over the course of about 9 to 12 months within about maybe I'd say an 18 to 24 month program is on average. And so, and, and then, you know, they may still be on probation for a period of time after that, but we want them at least in kind of in the safety net of the program, building those skills for a good year and a half to two years. So as a researcher myself, I have to say, I, I really love that this is so evidence-based and you're, you're very right in saying that the effectiveness of treatment courts has been phenomenal in reducing recidivism and even just improving someone's quality of life. Um, so do you have any specific examples of successful cases that you've seen go through the court? Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, do we have a lot of success stories? Um, so in particular, you know, I had an all-female caseload and um, they, every one of them, I think, have experienced significant trauma to varying degrees. And female participants can, can really pose some challenges in supervision because of that. And uh, a, a lot of times, you know, recovery support is a big part of what we are encouraging because once you're you know, have completed the program, what happens next? We have to teach our participants how to build, um, you know, recovery networks so they can, you know, continue to succeed. Well, you know, AA is a very popular one. It's, I think, I can't think of any other organization that has, you know, the more longstanding, you know, success, but a lot of times women, particularly traumatized women, uh, you know, don't connect with AA. I, I think, maybe you know, one of the initial tenets is admitting uh, you're powerless and, you know, and, and asking a traumatized woman to, you know, focus on powerlessness is not always, you know, the, the, the best idea. So in my group of women, uh, and they did this on their own, they built their own recovery network. Uh, they met each other in treatment. And, and I kind of found out about this just sort of accidentally. They formed their own group uh, and they called themselves the Sober Sisters. And they start, and they, you could not find a more diverse group in terms of age, race, ethnicity, you know, uh, sexual orientation, preference. I mean, they're completely diverse, but they had one thing in common. They wanted recovery and they did not have a lot of um, you know, support at home. So they started going um, to 
you know, bowling night, you know, restaurants, just like sober fun. And they would take their children with them and, uh, you know, and friends. And they just built their own support network that lasted, you know, far beyond the program. So one of the women uh, that was kind of one of the ringleaders was Daisy. And she had five children. And she took those children with her everywhere to all of the Sober Sister events. And so talk about uh, kind of breaking that cycle of addiction. Just powerful. So if you'd like, I'll show you a picture of her. Uh, The Houston Chronicle did a story on her. She was in my last uh, graduating class. She wasn't the, the first Sober Sister and she wasn't the last, but she certainly was memorable. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can share the screen and show it to you. Yes, thank you. Um, you show you the photo. I love the, the sober sisters. Yeah, so that's Daisy. She just says she's 33 and she's typical, you know, of um, my, my caseload in that she had been through the revolving door of the courthouse before. She you know, struggled with her addiction, but she really worked hard for her recovery. And, um, you know, this is one of the things, you know, she just, you know, what, once you start engaging recovery, those natural reinforcers start kicking in. You start you know, feeling better. Good things start happening in your life. You get jobs. You you repair those family relationships. You know, and for some of our women, like big things started happening. Regaining custody of their children and just like you know, really wonderful things. So uh, Daisy, uh, Daisy is just a really special person, but. Yeah, there were a lot of women like that. I think the older, one of the older women in the group was 65, Diana. She was another one, uh, Chelsea. You know, there, there are just many, many success stories like that. Uh, so uh, the, the program does work. And, and I think you know, people ask me, why does it work? Uh, you know, we know from research it does work, right? Uh, and the research doesn't tell us why, but I, I really think it has a lot to do with redemption because, Our participants have been through the system. They've had bad experiences with law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, even probation officers, because we all either directly or indirectly have the ability to put them in jail. So we're scary. And then when those same people are now your cheerleaders, your coaches, big part of your recovery system, I don't think we can ever underestimate the redemptive power of that relationship. It's just... It's really, it's really a special thing. It's just, uh, yeah, it, it, it's something that's hard to define, right? But it is very, very powerful. I'll go yeah. ahead and stop the share on that one. But uh, yeah, just a, it was a wonderful experience for me. I, I would agree with you. Um, I think that we know that human behavior responds better to positive reinforcement as opposed to punishment. And so, you know, you're more likely to change your behavior if you're being rewarded for something good especially if that's coming from like, if, if that's internal reward, right? And then we also know that having trust in the criminal justice system and its actors and feelings of legitimacy towards them are very important. And so, like you said, when you have these people who, who are supposed to be scary, working on your team and on your side and supporting you, that definitely is going to go a long way. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So do you have any, um, I'm, I know that most of the cases are success stories, which is amazing, um, but do you have any examples of some unsuccessful cases that you've seen go through your court? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, human beings are so complex. We're never going to have a a 100% success rate. So I think, you know, when, when we do have failures, uh, we have to look at our, our own practices. First of all, is our targeting correct? We know that drug court is not for everybody. It is, it's for the high risk, high need offender. If we put low risk people in, we can make them worse. We really can, right? Um, also, we have to treat the whole person. It's not just about addiction. We know the majority of our participants have co-occurring mental health issues and also trauma is a huge thing that kind of the research you know, I mean, the past five years or so, I mean, just think we need to assume trauma in this case. So, so if we're not providing those interventions, you know, then, then, then we're reducing the likelihood of success in our participants. Our participants have massive needs and a lot of barriers, housing 
employment, you know, and just like basics, like, you know, a lot of our participants are not food secure. So the more we can develop community partnerships, I, I think in a very real way, treatment courts do bring communities together. So part of the judge's job is community outreach. That's one of the 10 key components of drug court. You know, we should be forging those partnerships so we can provide things to our participants. A lot of times our community partners can do things that we can't because we don't have unlimited budgets. So, you know, uh, we can, we can, the more we can bring communities together, uh, you know, to help in this endeavor, you know, the more success we can have in our program. And, you know, and of course, it's also a research project. We're always collecting data and, and as good a job as we think we're doing, if we don't collect that data and if we don't look to see, you know, you know, what are our program completion rates? What are the recidivism rates? Are they reoffending six months out, a year out, you know, five years out? Now, if we're not looking at that and making adjustments, you know, we, we will have failures. So uh, that's very important. We have to look at community de demographics. Are we serving all aspects, you know, all groups in the community? And within our programs are all of those demographic groups succeeding equally. If not, then, you know, we need to up our cultural competency, right? So it, it's, it's, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle um, it, in, in a very real way. It's all research driven. And that's one of the things I love about the treatment court model, because so much of what we did and kind of the old school traditional approach is professional judgment, which is notoriously faulty, right? You know, it, it kind of feels right. Well, things that feel right, you know, it's 50-50. That's a roll of the dice. But things, you know, that are based on evidence, on research, you know, we have a better chance. In our own particular program, we had about a, a, a very decent 70% program completion rate. But when we started looking at our data, uh, we were back, I guess, back in the day before we knew as much as we know now, we were not doing gender specific treatment. When we just made a small adjustment like that, we separated out the men from the women and we really focused on upping our incentives, like you said, positive reinforcement. You know, whenever we, we kind of inherit this punitive approach from the traditional uh, justice system, you know, whenever we started focusing more on rewarding compliance than, you know, punishing technical violations, we saw our program completion rate soar from kind of the, kind of the tepid 70% to 86% by just doing those two things is really powerful. Looking at that data, yeah, so, so important. So, Absolutely. yeah. I think that you are in a unique position also that our audience will appreciate because your caseload was women. And we know that women are historically understudied within criminal justice. And we don't hear as much about the treatment for women and the success stories of women and what women go through. And that's especially important when you're talking about trauma, because we know, especially for women, there's a very, very big background of trauma in some way, shape or form. Absolutely. So we have to screen for trauma at the outset and we have to provide evidence based interventions. And there's some really good ones. Seeking safety is an excellent evidence based program. It's free. There's no reason for any jurisdiction not to be using seeking safety. And it can be delivered by the probation department. We don't have to have licensed clinicians. So there's there, you know, when we start looking, there are lots of things out there that are really effective. Uh, cognitive based interventions, there's some great ones. Again, uh, MRT, of course, is wonderful, but thinking for a change, free. So uh, we're only you know, kind of limited by our, our, you know, our own efforts, right? Right. You know, lots of resources out there for every jurisdiction. All we have to do is just look and we will find them. Can you just talk briefly on what Seeking Safety is for those who might not know who are watching this? So Seeking Safety is it, it is uh, an intervention for uh, people who have experienced trauma and it is um, it's in multiple segments. Right. And it addresses um, it addresses various aspects of trauma and it kind of it is what it sounds like, you know, finding ways to cope uh, with trauma and feel safe. Right. And um, it is the way it's set up. It is you can kind of 
uh, drop in at any time. It's there. Each capsule is, you know, in and of itself. So you don't have to start from the beginning and go to the end like some programs, which is really nice for a probation program because people can enter at any time. Um, and it's a group. It's a group class and it is gender specific. Um, so it, it's a it's a safe place where uh, men and women can talk about issues. I think a lot of people uh, may you know kind of feel like no, oh, that's a women's issue. Oh no, men experience trauma just like women do, and the men don't like to talk about it. Uh, so it's really good to have uh, have an intervention available, you know, for both for everybody, really for everybody. Absolutely. Well, thank you. My final question was, what do you attribute the success of treatment courts to, though you touched on that briefly? Well, I think as long as we adhere to the model, we're going to have success, right? Uh, it, it, the, uh, the, key, the key tenets, of course, uh, the 10 key components always uh, uh, you know, guide us. But I, I think uh, remembering uh, to follow the science, right? Uh, remembering that it is collaborative non-adversarial in nature, right? Um, and and really um, just to be patient. Boy, you know, when, when we're talking about addiction, it, it, this is a disease that, you know, our participants are going to struggle with for the rest of their lives. It's chronic, uh, but it's treatable, right? But, but healing the addictive brain takes a long time. So we have to be patient. We have to manage our expectations. People on the treatment court team, yeah, we are high achievers, right? And we cannot, we cannot, you know, you know, gauge our expectations, you know, and you know, to, uh, to our, our, our participants, right? You know, they, the things that, that are, are, are what might look like baby steps to us are really giant leaps for our participants. So we really have to train ourselves to spot it when they are when they are quietly succeeding. That's really a big deal. And we need to reward those baby steps with incentives, with praise, uh, until those natural reinforcers kick in that are just the, the benefits of good treatment, just, uh, just those natural reinforcers. So uh, I, I think that is the thing is just the adherence to the model. Patients, Instill, I think the short answer is instilling hope. I, there's a quote by Maya Angelou that I just love. And kind of just to summarize it, it's like, you know, people don't really, may not remember the things you say, uh, but they do remember the way you make them feel. And I think that's particularly true for, for treatment court. When, when we instill hope, and confidence. That's something, I'll give you an example. In uh, January, one of my participants from eight years ago, eight years, um, sent me a message on Facebook. And first of all, she told me that she was still in recovery, which was amazing. And the second thing she told me is that she had saved these um, sobriety milestone certificates that I'd given her. And these things are little pieces of paper. And so anytime that they achieve a milestone within a phase, like the first milestone might be 24 hours of sobriety, which is a big deal. A lot of our participants, you know, the age of onset is when they're children, right? And they may not have been sober for, you know, any period of time since, you know, maybe ever since as long as they can remember. So the first 14 days, first 30 days, 40, we're always celebrating with these little certificates. It looked like a kindergarten project. Why would somebody save these things for eight years? Well, you know, even with treatment, statistics show that, you know, people will stumble, they will falter. What kind of things will get them back in the saddle again? Yeah. Little things like that. Being able to look at that piece of paper and say, well, you know what? I did it before. That means I can do it again, right? So I, I, I think we cannot, uh, we cannot do these kinds of things enough, just instilling that hope and confidence. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you very much. We need more people like you in the criminal justice system, that's for sure, for the person-centered approach who follows the evidence. Um, uh, so it's refreshing to hear your experiences and your perspective, honestly. Well, thank you, Dr. Narvi. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. All right. Well, I really hope that everyone enjoyed that. 
that, like I said, was Judge Diane Bull. Judge Bull really talked to us throughout that about the ways in which rewards in treatment court programs improved program completion rates, uh, improved people's success stories. The next conversation that I'm going to share with you will give you real life practical examples of this put into practice with individuals who have actually gone through some of these programs um, and are willing to share their stories with us. So whenever you are ready, Rob, if you can go ahead and share that link. Okay, hi everyone and thank you for joining me today. As you all know, uh, my name is Chelsea Nervy. I'm an assistant professor at Sam Houston State University. I do research on corrections more generally. And um, today I am so, so thankful to have you all here. I really appreciate it. I'm going to start off with just going around. I'll state your names as I see them on my screen, just so that you can give a brief introduction, just your name, uh, your background or what you do, whatever you think is um, meaningful or relevant. So we'll start with Jennifer. Hi, I am Jennifer Garrick. I am the director at the Brazos County Community Supervision and Corrections Department, a department which is the formal name for adult probation. Um, started here as an intern 20, almost 28 years ago, and, um, and I'm still here because I truly believe in what we do here at probation. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Dan, you can take it away. Hi, my name is Dan Capus. Uh, I currently work as an electrician. Uh, I have been sober since January 9th of 2006 because uh, of God's grace, uh, Program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the probation department that, uh, that believed in me and helped me. Thank you for that. And good for you. Amy, you can go ahead. Hi, my name is Amy Brown, and I am a licensed chemical dependency counselor. I currently work at the adult probation in Brazos County with Jennifer. Um, I got to this position um, after being on probation. I spent almost 10 years on probation, um, all related to my substance use. I'm currently in recovery. I have been clean and sober since May 22nd in 1994. Um, and that is because of the probation department. I 100%, I mean, there are multiple people that played a part, but probation was a huge part of that. That's fantastic. Christy, go ahead. I'm Christy Steen. Uh, I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is uh, 4-28-2016. Um, I'm a mother of two daughters who uh, have every single one of my traits that drive me crazy. And uh, I'm grateful to be uh, here and a part of this. Thank you so much. And Jessica, last but not least. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Navar. Um, I've been sober since 7-6 of 2013. And um, I really owe that to the probation department because um, that's the whole reason I got into Alcoholics Anonymous is because of that program. Um, I don't have any children. Um, I pretty much do odd jobs here and there. But um, I'm just making it work, basically. So really, that's, that's, that's me. Hmm. Thank you so much. And thank you all for willing to share your stories. It really, really means a lot. So just prior to speaking with you all, I was speaking with Judge Diane Bull. And she ended that conversation with a quote that I'm going to read off to you and just ask for your opinions. And then I'll go on to a couple other questions. So Judge Bull said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. A very well-known Maya Angelou quote. Um, I'd just love to get some of your thoughts. You can kind of talk freely. This could be a super casual conversation about what you think. So anyone who wants to go for it. Chelsea, I want to chime in and just share that um, as part of my job, I'm the clinician in the uh, specialty court program here in Brazos County. We have a specialty court because we're not large enough to have all the courts that they are able to do around the United States, but um, it was formerly a drug court program. Um, and so two of the people that are here are graduates from that program. Um, so they had to work really hard to get where they are. Um, and with that quote, I will just say, um, it's true. I remember the names of the people. Actually, I remember the names of the people who made me feel bad about myself uh, better than the ones who made me feel good about myself. Um, but I will say that um, I had some officers uh, while I was here on supervision that I didn't like. 
Um, I understand that I'm the one who got myself put on probation. I'm the one who got myself here. And I would tell myself that every time I walked out the door, um, at times practically in tears because I felt like I was being um, threatened that I was going to go to prison over um, at that time I had gotten clean and sober, but I struggled with fees. Um, You know, I was a high school graduate. I wasn't a college graduate at that time. Um, And so I worked for minimum wage and some of the payments were high. They were hard for me to pay. Um, And so I would come in and basically get threatened that I was going to go back to court. I was going to go to prison to the point that I was, I I went over to the courthouse one day just to talk to my judge and say, look, if this is what you need to do to me, I totally understand, but I'm, I'm tired of being threatened. You know, I'm tired of feeling like um, I'm going to go to jail over something that while it wasn't totally out of my control, it was to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, and I was being clean and I was, I had done all my community service by then because I, I knew I didn't have the money to make payments. So I needed to do something. Um, so I did all the community service, but that, that was an awful experience. I felt really bad about myself. I was always scared. Um, and I didn't like that, <clears throat> but on the flip side of that, I had some officers that were extremely encouraging. Um, my officer, when I first, you know, because I got put on probation, I relapsed. Um, and fortunately, the judge put me back on probation and didn't send. But he, he told me, don't come back to my courtroom. And I took him real seriously. Um, and so um, I got put back on probation. And my very first officer, she was she was amazing. Her name was Annette. And I absolutely <laughs> love her. Um But And she told me later on when I started working here that I was teaching her. But when I came to her office and sat down, she would ask me, you know, how are your meetings going? What are you doing with your sponsor? You know, um, she was interested. She seemed like she was interested. She must have taken good notes because I'm sure she saw a lot of people. So to remember the things about me uh, personally, but it made me feel like she cared. Um, And I didn't feel intimidated. She would still remind me, as she should, that I would I needed to make my payments. That at that time I needed to do my community service, um, and all the things that are required while you're on probation. She would remind me, but I didn't feel intimidated by her. Um, I knew she was strict. She made it clear that if I didn't do what I was supposed to, you know, it might might not be pretty. But she didn't do it in a mean style, I guess. Um, and then throughout the years, I, I had multiple up op- for a while. I switched officers. It felt like every month I came back, there was a new officer. I don't think that was a good experience. Um, I never got to know those officers. Um, but towards the end, then I had some more officers where I stayed with that officer for a while and um, got to know them and they got to know me. Um, and I, I, I looked forward. I, told, I remember telling an officer one day, you are my counseling break. You know, I know that you have to talk to me for at least 15 minutes. So I'm going to tell you as much as I can in that 15 minutes. Um, And then and and I did. And then she would spend some time talking to me about what are some of the solutions in that. Um, So I appreciated those officers and I've talked enough. So I'll let the other ones give some feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. My name's Dan. Um, So I also had the same probation officer as Amy did. Um, I had been in trouble uh, all my life, even growing up uh, in and out of the Department of Corrections over and over. Uh, A judge named Judge Black out of Grosbeck, Texas, uh, gave me the opportunity to go to a a lockdown treatment facility for a year this last time. And uh, I took him up on it. And Annette was my first probation officer when I got out. I had 10 years of probation to do. Um, I uh, I didn't think she was all that amazing when I first met her. (laughs) Um, We had a conversation that she actually um, made me think for myself. She said, you've been in trouble all these years. How many times have you successfully completed probation or parole? And I said, never. And she said, I'll see you twice a week until further notice. And she held me accountable early on. But I can tell you, uh, I did everything that she wanted me to do uh, and, and that much more. And a bond became between me and her, a real strong bond. And I probably had her for about a year and a half. And she called me in her office before I got swapped out. And she said, I know if we let you off probation right now that you would be okay, Dan Tapas. Um, And I took that to heart. And I also had a half a dozen probation officers after that. I did uh, uh, 10 years to the day of probation, less one day. Uh, I was getting off on a Saturday, so they let me off on a Friday. Woo! 
Um, but I can tell you all those officers that I had, including Annette, were there the day that I got off that I graduated from probation. And that meant the world to me. Uh, but I, I got involved and I did all the things that Annette wanted me to do. Uh, and then it became me coming in once a month and telling her what a great life I had. Um, and, and it was an amazing deal. Now, when Annette um, retired two or three years ago, I was asked to come to her uh, retirement party at the probation department. And I had such a good friendship with most of the probation people there that I was taken back and they asked me to say a few words. And I talked about Annette and I, I looked up and, and most women were crying and one or two men were crying uh -huh. um, because she had that type of impact on me. And I just want to talk about the Brazos Valley uh, probation department in general. Um, they challenged me to think differently. Um, they never made me feel like I, I should be scared. Um, they held me accountable. And uh, and I'm thankful for that. I, I mean, I just celebrated 15 years of sobriety in, in January. Uh, and I can let you know that when I got off probation, for just a short while, I felt like a fake and a phony in, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the day that I got off, my sick brain started telling me, well, you're off paper now. You could just okay. twist a bedroll and get on your Harley and get out of here. Um, but I kept going to Alcoholics Anonymous and I kept sharing what I was thinking instead of keeping that stuff in. Uh, and I've been off parole probation for five, five plus years now. Uh, and I have an amazing life. And, and that's due, I mean, not only to, uh, to Annette, uh, but to, to Billy and his wife, Amy, to Christy, who's here with us. Um, you know, to all the people that are involved in my life. Thank you. Yep. Y'all, I got to quit out of here at uh, three o'clock. I have an appointment at three 15. So no problem, Dan, you can hop off whenever you need to. I think Jennifer okay. wants to say something. Yeah. One of, you know, one of the things I remember being an officer is, um, you know, to me, whoever was on probation, whoever was on my case, like whoever I was supervising, they were a human being. And so to me, it was always important to treat them as a person, not as a cause number. So what might work one well with one of my folks might not work well with somebody else. And so it was finding that balance between what does what motivates this person? What motivates this person? What can I do to encourage them to help them? And when you talk about the, the quote that you talked about, about people uh, always remembering how you made them feel. Um, I had a guy I had worked with for a long time. He just, he, it just, did, he just didn't, didn't get it. Didn't, wasn't ready, whatever. Went to prison, ended up getting revoked and going to prison. He called me when he got out of prison and he said, thank you. He said, you tried. He said, you, you encouraged me. You, you did. She said, you tried and I wasn't ready. And so when someone calls you years later, or even now when I see somebody on the street that I supervised 20 years ago, and they say, hey, do you remember me? I'm doing well. Or, and thank you so much for, you know, all the things that you that you did for me or helped me. And to hear, you know, Dan say and, and Amy say thank you to their officers. Um, it's just really important that I think, you know, we, we are treating people as humans um, and not as cause numbers. And I think that, you know, that's just awesome for you know life in general and I like that Jennifer because I, I used to come speak to the department before I was employed here about my experiences and and the way that I would start it off was explaining all the different things about my life so I would say you know I'm a wife I'm a daughter I'm a sister um, I'm a student because I went to school um, I'm also a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and I rattled off all of that stuff that's about me before saying and I'm a criminal you know because that because for a long time I let criminal mold who I was and it wasn't who I was. It was something I did. It was a mistake I made. Um, and I felt like if, if officers can look at it like that, like, yes, you're a criminal. Yes, you made some mistakes, but you're also a person. Um, and, and tell me your story. How did you end up in front of me? Um, it, it's a good way to work, at least with somebody like myself. I think that everything you're, you're, you're all saying is really hitting everything on the nose. And I'm definitely picking up even some themes just that, I mean, from a research perspective, we know that threat and fear doesn't work to deter crime. You know, we really need that feeling of trust and legitimacy and reciprocity in a relationship, right? 
And then Amy, to your point about being a criminal, my, my mind instantly goes like that. That's not a label to give yourself. Mm -hmm. You're a person who committed a crime. Mm -hmm. Even, even within, within papers I write, I don't use the word inmate. I use people who are incarcerated, a person who is incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we realize how much just changing sometimes our rhetoric can change the way people think about things. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about the specialty court of the drug court programs, because they don't refer to them as defendants. They're participants. They're participants in the program. Absolutely. Um, so I did want to ask just a bit more of a logistical question for the audience. Um, if someone would go ahead and just briefly explain how exactly probation works in the United States. I'm sure that it's different um, cross-culturally and across countries and how maybe it differs from parole here. Um, well, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead. Dan. No, you got it. Well, you're the one that has to leave. Go ahead and say what you want. You want to go ahead and say what you want to say. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I've been on parole. Um, I did four different parole uh, pro, uh, terms in prison. And then during that time, I would get parole violations and go back and then come back out. So I've probably been on it a half dozen times. And I can tell you that um, for one thing, I didn't ever have any fines and restitution with them. It was just a simple fee every month. Um, and it never seemed like any of those were concerned about what was going on in my life. And I can tell you with, with, and being on probation a half dozen times in my life, um, it always seemed like the probation department was more interested in what was going on in my life. And even though I didn't successfully do it all those other times, I still remember some of those probation officers really caring. Uh, I don't remember parole officers caring too much. Um, but, you know, that could have been um, my perspective at the time. I don't know. So that's what I've found to be true. Go ahead. And I think just in a more general, general term, parole is after you have served a term in prison, granted, yeah. being granted um, parole by a parole board, whereas probation is, <clears throat> is prior to that. It is more of a community supervision um, prior to being hopefully never sentenced to prison. It's an, it's an option the court has um, to place someone who, who has committed a crime, place someone in a continuum of programs and sanctions um, so that they can remain in the community, hopefully rehabilitate, work on any kind of criminogenic need that might have led to that behavior in the first place so that they don't ultimately end up in prison. Great, thank you for that. Um, so the next question I'd love for some of you to touch on is what do you think attributed to some of your success going through probation? I know Amy and Dan, you kind of talked a little bit about your stories. Um, what can you, when you look back, um, think about that you feel has made you successful? I would like to speak on that. I'm Christy. Um, I can contribute all of my success to uh, being pushed into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and it, it was given to me whenever I first signed my probation papers, you know, when I was just doing it so I could get out of jail. You know, I had two daughters that I needed to take care of that um, hadn't been stripped away from me yet completely. And um, my goal was to stay clean and sober and do that, you know, be a mom again. And I couldn't do it. Um, I did it for about a month and a half. And, and uh, I remember my officer trying to helped me many times and I just blow them off. I was trying to think of how I could get around this and uh, trying to program my, uh, my addiction around those drug tests that they were giving me. You know, I knew that I had it once a month and um, that was before they went to this calling every single day to see if it's your day, you know? So, um, and of course that failed me and I got put into a drug court and uh, I didn't have it, want to hear anything they had to say either because in my mind I was unique. You know, I was the only person I knew that who had this wonderful life and family and completely threw it all away in her addiction, you know, and uh, nothing that any professional had to say to me was going to get through to me because they hadn't been where I'd been. And so they sent me off to treatment and I learned some stuff and uh, it helped me deal with the guilt that I was uh, feeling. And when I came back, uh, one of the drug court counselor at that time was Mickey B., and um, I walked into her office and I still had this mentality that you can't talk to me because um, you haven't been where I've been. 
and she started telling me about herself and she'd been exactly where I'd been, you know, like Amy, she had that past and uh, she had been right there. She had kids and horrible stuff had happened to them. And, and she told me all of that and she made herself human to me in my, in my condition. And, and look where she was at today, you know, and she, she, she told me that I could be the mother that my kids deserved, you know, and uh, that was the turning point for me. I was, I started going to meetings. I got involved in those meetings. I got a sponsor like she told me to, and I did exactly what my sponsor suggested. And then I turned around and I gave it to other people and I'd have never gotten any of that if not for, uh, for drug court. I don't want to stop there because I'm a crier. (laughs) I'm going to cry. You know how many times I've been fighting back tears this whole time. So Um, Jessica, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, um, I know that, um, oh, without a shadow of a doubt, I wouldn't have came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous if I wasn't pushed into it. Um, I mean, probation had a big part to do with that, but in all honesty and wholeheartedly, um, specialty court is what, um, kept me going, um, because it's a program that, that, that encourages you. And it also, um, it lets you know, hey, you're doing a good job. You know, um, yeah, it, it, they call you out on the stuff that you're not doing right, but they call you out in front of everybody. So that way everybody knows that you're not doing right. And they, they kind of, it sounds kind of mean, but it's not mean, but they kind of like make an example of you. And uh, um, they want you to be in these meetings. You know, they want you to participate. They want you to get a sponsor. They want you to work the steps. And every time that you do something that you're supposed to do, you get, I mean, I guess rewarded, I don't know, um, like keep extending yourself and, uh, there, and, um, I, I don't even know where I'm going. All I know is that, um, my probation officer that I had while I was in the specialty court program, he was one of those officers that treated me like a human being. Um, like literally wanted to know what was going on in my life, how my job was going, how, you know, how, how is it going at home? You know, how's, how's your boyfriend? How's, you know what I'm saying? Like, how are your dogs all the way down to that? Like he really, really cared about me as a person. And I remember Jennifer from when I first got put on probation and, um, I still remember how nice she was to me. She didn't treat me like a number. Um, she didn't treat me like the scum of the earth because of my background. She treated me like a human being. And um, that that made me want to keep doing better. Um, And just seeing what I have today and um, what I didn't have back in the day, it just makes me, it, I'm just in complete awe of this program. Um, And because I finally gave myself to this program Um, and just probation is not that hard. It's not that hard if you do what you're supposed to do. Um, for so long, I always thought that my probation officers before I was in specialty court were always out to get me and always wanted me to fail and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's just a, a money thing, but it's really not. As long as you do what you're supposed to be doing, I mean, good things are going to happen from it. Uh, I, that's all I got. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, and I definitely agree. I think that having those rewards and even being called out in front of everyone, it's, it's just accountability, right? Like, so that's what you need sometimes. That's what we all need as human beings. And we need that positive reinforcement as well, as opposed to just like lock them up and throw away the key, which serves no one most of the time. Anyone else want to share anything else before we move on to the next question? Okay. So um, one of my next questions was, what do you think works well within probation or even specialty courts? Um, and what do you think might still need to be changed? Okay, I I'll think, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Jessica. Okay. I think, um, like, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Like, positive reinforcement really is what works. Um, and what really doesn't work is having an officer that is not really caring about you. Like you're just a, what is it? What did Jennifer say? A cause number, case number, whatever. Like you're just a number. Um, cause having an officer that 
treat you like you're just a number like it's it's you don't know you have all these good things going on in your life and they can't I mean I know they're not supposed to be my friend okay I know that but it's just like if you could just be like hey good job keep up the good work that would help you know thankfully I'm in I'm in it already this deep that you know I mean positive reinforcement is okay but if you're still going to treat me as a number that's okay because I know today I'm not a number um, I know that I'm a human being and I know that I'm working on myself every day and um, just noticing, you know, good things. And what's the word? Not really praising or rewarding. I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it's a cool word. But just actually caring about the individual who's across the who's across from your desk, you know, and not just trying to rush through the whole thing. That's that's what. That's how I feel. Thanks, Jessica. Um, for me, I, I, I agree with Jessica. The positive reinforcement works best. I think that for an officer, in, in my experience, for an officer, they still have to be able to do their job. So, you know, there's, there's a balance in there of positive reinforcement, but yet reminding somebody, you know, these are the consequences if you choose to not do what you're supposed to do. And you can do that in a manner as in that you don't have to be a jerk. Um, but positive reinforcement in the, in the specialty court program seems to really work as, as low as a clap, you know, they make fun of us, I think, because we're the clapping court, which is weird, but we clap. And even if you didn't do everything you were supposed to do, we still clap because you came to court knowing that you're probably gonna get a sanction. You know, you still took responsibility for what you're doing. So we still clapped. Um, I teach treatment groups here and y'all, I put little stickers on their homework when they do everything they're supposed to. And the first time I had somebody come to me and say, oh, why didn't I get the glitter sticker? I was like, wow, these adults really care about the stickers. You know, if that's something that simple, wouldn't have that big of an impact, but it does. It doesn't have to be an extreme, you know, um, because in specialty court, we, we used to do, um, prior to COVID, we used to do gift cards and things like that. It doesn't even have to be that. It can be something really simple as a positive reinforcement as good job. You know, I'm really, I'm really proud of what you did. You know, what's the plan next? You know, what are you going to do next? Um, but again, at the same time, you got to be able to, to, um, verbalize that there are some consequences too. You know, I think that's what works in specialty court. And I think that's what works in probation is being able to say, you know, here's, 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 do you understand what the consequences are going to be? Some of them don't, you know, some of them don't even understand what the rewards could be if they do what they're supposed to, you know? And so I feel like for me, part of it is instilling the hope. And that's why I share my story with so many people that come in my office. Yes, I was a convicted felon. You know, yes, I served 10 years of probation, almost. I got off a little bit early. I looked it up the other day. I never looked myself up. I looked it up the other day, and I think I only got off like a month and a half early. But either way, I got off early, um, you know, and that was an incentive for me. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and you can look at... Um, clemency and and all those good things if you do what you're supposed to do and you change your life really you're changing your whole life you're trusting that officer in front of you to give you some guidance on how to change your life more positively and if you can do that there are great things just like everybody's talked about good things happen if i just keep doing what i'm supposed to do um, and a lot of people come in with a real negative you know the man's out to get me um, and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm a, a perfect example of the man wasn't out to get me. The man was trying to help me. Mm -hmm. um, and officers really have a huge part in, in that thought process just based on how they treat you. Um, we're so fortunate in this county to have such a strong um, in-house substance abuse counseling program um, led by Amy and her team of counselors and our specialty court in this in this um, county. It's amazing. Um, I would love for there to be enough funding statewide for there to be more programs like that, that money wouldn't be an issue for counties to run programs like that. Um, while we have great, you know, we do great stuff with our substance abuse folks here to have the money to, to for anger management or mental health or, you know, sexual abuse or any kind of, you know, domestic violence, any kind of programs, um, I would love for it to be, whether it's money from the state, whether it's money from sources, I mean, I just let, you know, I would be loved to be able to 
no matter what kind of help or counseling or treatment people needed, that it was, they, you know, that it never came down to, you know, the cost for, for some of our folks. Um, and when we're talking about positive reinforcement or saying something positive, Jessica, I think you were exactly right when you said praise or positivity or whatever you said. Um, and I still remember the day one of my defendants came in and he had just, uh, he had just passed a section of his GED. And I said, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. And he said, what did you say? I said, I'm so proud of you. You passed that section of your GED. And he said, nobody, nobody tells me that. Like he was so caught off guard. And then years later, he comes back and he says, do you remember that day you said you were proud of me? Like, I still remember this 20 something years later. I mean, you know, so I think we really can impact a lot of people. Um, and I think it's about going back to treating them as, as human beings. Absolutely. You all have really, really powerful stories. I'm trying not to get all, <laughs> but um, that was really all I had. Um, any, any other thoughts or questions that you all have or comments that you think should be addressed that I didn't think about having never gone through this myself? Ladies, Christy. I mean, I don't, um, I I'm very fortunate to have been, you know, put into Brazos County to deal with this. Uh, and I, I don't think I would have got the, um, the help I needed if it had been another county. You know, I now live in Robertson County and I know people in Robertson County who are on probation and it's a totally different uh, ball game. It's a totally different set of people. And um, I'm sure they treat people, you know, right because people do succeed over there. But um, I know had it not been for, for my officer and my judge and, and my counselor and Amy and Billy, there's there's no way I could be where I am today. You know, I could not get get past myself to 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 get to my sick, you know, to get to my potential. And they helped me do that. So, you know, I will say that's that's a very interesting point, especially considering I think what the U.S. has over like 3000 counties or something. And you can if you commit the exact same act within a five mile radius, you might have a completely different response. Right. Oh, Just because right. of the differences in counties. And that's definitely something that is very unique to, to this country. So I think the audience will appreciate pointing that out as well. Uh -huh. I would agree. I don't think that I would have made it off. Um, a 10 year sentence is pretty steep. Um, and I don't think I would have made it off um, or my life would have changed. You know, the probation department, I had excellent parents. Yeah, I didn't, I am not like a lot of people who had the problems that I did with substances. Neither of my parents were addicts, but I was adopted. So I, um, I believe in genetics. Um, I was a military brat. I think the social aspect of that caused a little bit too much stress for me. And I turned to drugs and alcohol. Um, but, and when I got on, put on probation, um, the officers helped parent me to an extent, you know, my dad, my dad was, it, I just love him. He did everything he, he could for us, but he was a little bit of an enabler. You know, I would get a lecture. He would save me. He couldn't save me from probation. You know, when I got in trouble again and went back to jail, he couldn't get me out of jail. I was a no bond, you know, and that was where I learned um, that I needed to really change things or I was going to keep doing things to go to jail. And, and at that point, I trusted the department to, to lead me in the right direction. And they kind of parented me. You know, it was a tough love place that I didn't really get from my parents because they really just wanted to help. You know, they really just wanted to coddle me. And uh, that wasn't working. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have been on probation in this county, like Christy said, to have the officers that I did, um, the experiences that I did, and the encouragement that I got from most officers that I got. And I still do. You know, I'm still a convicted felon, and I, and I have a judge, and I have attorneys, and I have all kinds of people going, why aren't you filing for that pardon? And I have no answer for you on that. Um, but, you know, I, I have people who are still involved with this county that are encouraging me um, to do something positive and embrace my story, um, as a learning experience, you know, um, and, and to share it with other people that it is possible to get off probation as long as you kind of do what you need to do and follow their guidance. You know, nothing an officer told me to do was going to get me, me put in jail. Nothing that anybody in AA or NA told me to do or suggested I do was going to get me put in jail, but left to my own devices, I was going to jail. Um, and so I needed that guidance from, from all of that. And, and, and 
and, and probation led me to treatment and treatment led me to recovery. Um, and I'm very fortunate that I didn't die from this disease that I have. Yeah, um, you're very right. I, I think that also uh, alcoholism, drug addiction is not talked about as openly as it should be uh, because I'm sure a lot of people struggle with it and they don't openly speak about it. There's this shameful, um, I guess, umbrella over it. Personally, my grandfather died of alcoholism at 56 years old. Um, my uncle suffers with drug and alcohol addiction right now. Um, and so I, I could see, I've seen what it can do to your life. Right. And then your stories are very, very inspiring. And I think I go, go ahead, Jessica. Okay, I just want to say something else real quick. Um, when I was in specialty court, okay, uh, when I was in specialty court, I messed up real big, real, real big. And um, I was really scared that I was going to get sent off, like the worst case scenario sent off. And um, they didn't do that. Whereas if I was on just regular probation, I'm pretty sure I would have been sent off. But they sent me to a treatment facility. Well, a state-funded treatment facility, Safe P. Um, they sent me there instead of send, throw it, locking me up and throwing away the key. You know, um, because they saw something in me that I didn't see in me. And them doing that for me, that people pay a lot of money to go to those kind of treatments and to get that kind of treatment and to get that kind of cognitive cognitive training and teaching they pay a lot of money for people to go to those and they sent me to that for nine months I was mad at them for a long time and I hated them for a long long time but when I got out I saw the difference in my attitude I saw the difference in the way I looked at life I saw the difference at the way that I I looked at them as people you know I didn't hate them anymore um so I really truly owe my sobriety to that specialty court team and that probation officer that I had at that time, during that time I was there, because I'm that I don't, I really don't know where I would be if it wasn't for them saying this is what we're gonna do and giving me a second chance. You know, like they didn't throw the key away. They didn't. They didn't lock me up and throw the key away and forget about me. And it's like she's not savable. Like they saw that I was something inside of me was savable, and they helped me find that. And uh, I'm forever grateful for that program, forever grateful. So um, that's that's it. Thanks. And I think that's awesome, Jessica, that you're grateful to that program. But if you think about it, if you even go back before specialty court, somebody saw that same thing in you or they wouldn't have sent you to specialty court. Very true. And it's, you know, one of the things I always, as an officer, you know, it can get stressful and it can get, you know, are we, am I doing everything I can do to help, to help folks? And when awesome ladies like y'all share your stories about how much your officer has helped you or the department helped you or specialty court helped you, and even folks, you know, along the way, and I think that's one of the things that officers really, you know, wow, that's inspiring to us where we can be like, wow, man, look at y'all, like, y'all are doing this, y'all are amazing, but to know that we might have had a little, a little part in that, I mean, y'all did the work, but to know, you know, that we had a little part in that, as an officer, I don't think I'd be here 28 years later, still loving what I do, if I didn't see stuff like this, and so it's really, it's really awesome, so thank y'all, thank y'all for sharing y'all stories, I truly appreciate it. So do I. I, I really need to second what, what Jennifer said, thank you so much. Um, that was all I had. So if there's nothing else, I, I really can't thank you all enough from the bottom of my heart and Dan as well, though he had to jump off. Um, your stories are very inspiring and I am sure that the audience is going to love hearing them. So I really thank you all for taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, just in closing, um, I hope that the audience that tuned in learned something today. Um, and I know I did. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. That was a really, um, really insightful. I mean, you know, Rob and I were having some side, side conversations and I, I think it's also a really great way to end 
the news desk today because we've had such a wide ranging um, set of uh, speakers and conversations around, you know, COVID pandemic, um, you know, from the Nigerians talking about, um, you know, the president having a decree that basically said, we've got our empty prisons to, to, to stop the spread. And then that almost like helping to spur on the restorative justice stuff, because now it has to be done. Um, from, you know, the smart prisons, talking to the guys in Finland about, you know, smart prisons and maybe getting away from smart being technology and new and actually how can we put some of that smart thinking into traditional prisons and of course you know the thing that underpins all of this is is the impact of individuals you know i'm, I'm an ex-offender myself i spent some time in prison you know I'm, I'm a journalist and you know i run a center now and i'm lucky to be able to do what i do teaching at the university but you realize some of the people that i've met now when i when i was listening to those people there i was thinking back to people that i'd met and, you know, from that kind of, you know, it's an occupational hazard going to prison. You know, it was a sabbatical. It was they were still on the treadmill. There was no they didn't have a long sentence. So therefore, they were never going to get the treatment they needed. Whereas, in fact, what we're talking about here, people whose lives have turned out completely differently simply because they were the funding was there to do something innovative to stop them going to prison before that being then being able to sort your life out afterwards is about, is it needed? And so I think it's, it's really insightful. And I think there's a lot of people will get a lot out of that actually on the network. And uh, that's incredible. The fact that you managed to get those people together and me and Rob are sitting there nodding at each other <laughs> to have to say those things. I think, um, yeah, that's amazing. You know what I mean? Are you proud of yourself? I think you should be proud of yourself as well. Yeah, giving all these other people praise, but I think you should <laughs> deserve some as well. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think it went well. It was the first time I've ever done anything like this. So I was I was happy with it. I hope, hope you keep doing it as well. And please keep sharing it with the network. I know the network will be uh, amazed. And please, you know, share with your colleagues and anyone that you know, you know, the value of the network. And if they want to record something and send it to us, you know, that we, we will definitely do something with it. I think it's, it, it's, in, it's incredible. And, and please stay in touch. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Thanks.